Okay, so it's my honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob Creeper. <laughs> Thank you for the, the incredibly kind introduction. I assure you for, to the people on Zoom that you missed absolutely nothing important. Um, can you guys see the uh, images on Zoom? Yes. No. Okay. No. <laughs> yes. So, um, so welcome to uh, Surgical Psychology 101. Um, first and foremost, I really want to thank you for this uh, invitation. Uh, this is an incredible honor uh, for me to be here amongst um, friends and colleagues from Sages who I've known for years, um, uh, and to particularly to Dr. Feldman, who really has been an incredible uh, mentor and sponsor for me personally, um, for really no reason that I can ever identify. I think it's just who she is as a human being, um, and it uh, it has always meant an incredible amount to me. So thank you uh, for everything that you've done, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's an incredible honor. Um when I look back at the list of previous Sigmund visiting professors, this is a lot of sort of my heroes in surgical education. This is a very daunting list, and I feel incredibly humbled to to be counted among it. And it was uh, it was also fun to kind of look back at the other visiting professors that you have and find that my wife, not surprisingly, beat me to the punch by about uh, six years as she was your uh, McLean visiting professor back in 2017. So uh, at least we we both had the opportunity to be here, which is fantastic. Uh, these are my disclosures for this talk. So I get research support from Medtronic uh, for uh, uh, hernia trials and have consulted for a robotics company named Distal Motion. Uh, my wife is the president and co-founder for the Academy for Surgical Coaching, and I do reference that a little bit, but it is uh, she makes no uh, money for that job. In fact, it's been a financial loss for the Greenberg family, so I don't know if that's a, a good disclosure or not. And she's a counselor for the American Board of Surgery. Um, but I do have a, a disclaimer, which is that I, I uh, have no personal experience in psychology whatsoever. I was actually a music major uh, as an undergraduate, so uh, never took a psychology class, didn't really know much of anything about it. Um, and in fact, if I'm being brutally honest with everyone and myself, I did have to kind of Google the word psychology just to make sure I was spelling it right before uh, deciding on the title for this talk. Um but I figured if this is like our, at our college courses, we have 101 courses, right? Those are introductory courses at university. And so every course that I've ever taken has a syllabus. So I wanted to create a syllabus for this next 45 minutes. Um, and so the rationale of this course is to provide a basic understanding of the behaviors that lead to, and in many cases derive from a mastery of surgery, which I think is the goal for most of us over the course of our careers. Um, and to provide some real world strategies to help facilitate those behaviors. So for anyone who has any interest in some of these topics, um, just like any other university course, this is your required reading. So these are the set of books that kind of uh, went into uh, making this talk. Um, all of them uh, interesting in their own regards, and we'll kind of march through them sort of one at a time. Now, I, you know, I think most of us probably got into medicine through some of the, the more normal sciences, right? Biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics. Um, and as such, I feel like uh, it was important to create an equation for successful surgery. Uh, and so here's my equation that D times P plus G squared over G times M equals F sub L. All right. So that's the equation for successful surgery. Over the next 40 minutes or so, you're going to take two different midterm evaluations. So at some point, you're going to need your phone uh, with your notes pad on it uh, or some, a piece of paper so that you can write down some numbers. Uh, and your final grade is about 1% of those midterm evaluations and 99% uh, the performance in your uh, professional career for the next 40 years of your life or so. So psychology as a science derives uh, from the Greek roots, meaning the study of the psyche or soul. Um, and it's really the science of behavior in mind. And psychologists um, form their theories and, and their conclusions by studying individuals or, or groups of individuals um, and establishing general principles that guide their way through life. Um, and they usually use specific case examples to do that. And so when I think about that, like who could be more interesting to study than us as surgeons, right? We're a pretty unique breed. In this picture um, is Zbigniew Religa. Uh, Dr. Religa was a, a cardiac surgeon in Poland. Uh, and this in 1985 was the National Geographic picture of the year. Um, what you're seeing here is Dr. Religa, who's just completed the first cardiac transplant in the history of Poland. It was apparently a grueling operation, took several, um, several hours, many, many hours. And here we see Dr. Religa sitting next to his patient, bloody gloves on, glasses in hand, um, 
looking at his patient's vital signs and making sure that his patient is doing well. You can see the assistant is kind of back here sleeping. Anesthesia might be doing a crossword puzzle somewhere off on the side. It's unclear. Um, but this is what we do as surgeons, right? This is, this is what we train to do. These are the skills that we develop and these are the commitments that we have to our patients. And it's really an incredible honor and privilege to get to do what we need to do. But it's hard, right? We, we sacrifice a lot to do this, but I think when times are hard, it's important to remember the impact that we can have. This is Taddeus Kizkevitz. He's the patient in that picture. And there's 25 years of time difference in between these two photographs. So because of Dr. Religa's skill, Mr. Kiskevitz lived an additional 25 years of life and then some. And that is, that's an incredible thing that we get to do and unfortunately often take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives. So how do we get to do that? How do we have the privilege of becoming surgeons uh, that, can, that can really save lives and prolong life? To me, it starts with deliberate practice. Um, and that's the first uh, step of the equation for successful surgery. So I was introduced to this concept in reading the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And this is the, uh, now that I think about it, the first time I've ever given this talk in front of a Canadian crowd. But the first chapter of this book focuses on the Canadian Junior Hockey League, in particularly uh, the major A players. And as far as I can understand it, they're like the elite of the elite of Canadian Junior Hockey, right? They are the ones that go on to play at Division I schools and then go on to play in the NHL. And when you look at the rosters of these teams, you might think it's very haphazard and that some people have more talent than others. Actually, it's not. It has to do with their birth dates, right? The rollover date for the Canadian Junior Hockey League is January 1st. And so the majority of people that make it onto the major eight teams were born in January, February, or March, as compared to people born in October, November, and December. There's almost, if you think about it, a year's worth of growth and development in between those two groups of ages. And so the January, February, and March kids are much bigger. They probably have more body control. And then once that happens, they make the team and then they get more ice time, more coaching, more playing time, and the talent gap just widens and widens. And as a corollary, if you look at the European junior soccer leagues, the cutoff date is June 1st. And there you see the same phenomenon with kids being born in June, July, and August versus those born in March, April, and May, right? So it has more to do with their size, but then really coaching, practicing, training, and playing. Uh, Joe Flom was a, a Jewish attorney who practiced in New York City. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, he couldn't find work in Christian law firms, so he joined a smaller Jewish law firm, and they did work that they that was sort of viewed as beneath the Christian law firms. And what they did was corporate takeovers and mergers and acquisitions. And so he accrued a significant amount of experience in that type of law, much more so than really any of the other big firms. And then in the 1980s, when corporate buyouts and mergers and acquisitions became commonplace, he was the name that everyone kept hearing, and he was the person to go to. And he then joined Skadden Arps, one of the biggest corporate financial law firms in New York City, and became a partner um, and had an incredibly successful career and was really sort of known as like the father of mergers and acquisitions. Again, not because of specific talent, but because of experience and practice. Um, Bill Gates didn't just sort of invent the personal computer. He actually had access in Seattle to computing uh, labs uh, and teachers at a community college that was right by his house. So when he was a young student, he would go seek extra classes. He would work in the lab. He would gain experience and he would gain practice so that he could help develop and, and popularize the uh, personal computer. Um, hopefully everyone knows who these four are, right? The Beatles. Um, the Beatles, before they came to America and started the British invasion, went to Germany where they played show after live show after live show every single day and every single night. And they practiced their stage routine as well as their songs. And so when they came on the Ed Sullivan show, um, they were incredibly talented and, and started the British invasion. So what what we're talking about here is actually practice, right? And, and the real concept behind this is from a PhD psychologist who was a former Sigmund lecturer as well, Anders Ericsson. Um, he's a PhD psychologist at Florida State University, and he has really dedicated his career to the concept of studying uh, how elite performers practice. And he posits that there's three different types of practice. There's naive practice where you just kind of do something repeatedly. Uh, Dr. Sigmund, we were talking about golf last night. That's what I do. Like, I don't actually commit any time to practice. I just go out there and like swing clubs. And not surprisingly, I don't get any better. Like, I'm not good to begin with. I think it's fun, but I don't improve because I don't take lessons and I don't actually practice them. I just go and hit balls. 
Um, there's purposeful practice where your practice has some well-defined and specific goals. Um, purposeful practice involves feedback um, and it requires you to practice outside of your comfort zone. So instead of just going and doing the same thing over and over again, you identify some area of weakness and you practice that. Um, and, and again, it helps because you then are improving and, and working on your weaknesses rather than your strengths. But the ideal way to practice is actually deliberately. Um, and this is the gold standard for performance improvement. And the difference between deliberate practice um, and the lesser stage is that deliberate practice requires a coach. It requires someone who watches you, who identifies those weaknesses, and then helps you to coach through and practice specifically on those weaknesses so that those weaknesses become strengths. And once they have, they identify your next weakness and you work on that. So you continue to sort of improve in this stepwise fashion with someone watching you and guiding you through it. Um, now, if you look at these, uh, at the requirements of delivered practice, right, that you need a teacher or a coach, you need detailed or immediate feedback, um, you have to have the opportunity to improve performance through task repetition, that is like everything that we do in surgical residency, right? And that's how your faculty gets you to go from being a beginner trainee uh, to an expert trainee and to someone who's ready to join a faculty at the end of practice. Um, the one thing about delivered practice is that it is cognitively um, overloading. So most people can't maintain that for more than about an hour. Um, the cognitive overload is very high. So when you practice in this meaningful way, you can do it for short bursts, but otherwise you start to mentally fatigue. And so you need to give yourself breaks uh, and then come back to it the next day. So uh, with all these psychological principles, I wanted to have a case study um, since that's what psychologists do. And my case study for deliberate practice is two brothers, uh, Randy and Mike. Um, Randy uh, and Mike grew up uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Um, they took to music at a very young age. Uh, Randy picked up the trumpet because that was one of the two instruments offered at the high school where they went to school. Uh, Mike started on the clarinet because that was the other one and then very quickly transitioned to saxophone. Um, both of them uh, went to the Indiana University School of Medicine before dropping out to try and uh, make it as jazz musicians in New York City. Um, and they actually had very successful careers. So they formed a band called the Brecker Brothers. They started a, a really a jazz fusion. So at the kind of interface between jazz and rock, they were session musicians on a number of different uh, um, albums by a ton of famous performers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and over the course of their careers, uh, Mike uh, won about 15 Grammys and Randy about seven. Um, they did that through practice. Right. They practiced and practiced over and over. And again, when they got better and better at their skill, they would practice the things they weren't good at. They would record their live shows and listen back to the solos that they made mistakes in and then specifically practice them to make those better. Uh, and then when they started writing their own music, they worked on their composition again through deliberate practice, usually with a coach. Now, there's thousands, maybe millions cases of uh, of elite performers who who um, I could have picked here, but I picked the two of them not because they're unique or, or different in many ways. They were successful, but I picked them because of their sister. Um, their sister was also an outstanding musician. She plays both piano and harp. Uh, but instead of deciding to, to um, pursue a career in music, she wanted to start a family. So she married uh, a lawyer uh, and raised four children outside of Philadelphia as well. Um, this one is now a lawyer uh, at a big New York law firm. Uh, this one's the editor in chief of Random House. Uh, this one is a chef. Uh, and this one who's behaving very poorly and, and wearing awfully short shorts uh, is me. Uh, so this was my family. Um, and I had the opportunity from a really young age to get to see what it was like to be a sort of high level professional musician. And I remember that we would be at their houses for Thanksgiving and they would go and practice. Um, it's just what they did every single day. It was part of their routine. Uh, and, and I think that set in for my siblings and I of what it takes to be, um, really, uh, good at what you want to do. Um, so how do we foster that amongst our trainees? Um, there are tons of ways to do this, right? So this is what the Sim Lab is perfect for. Um, and if you're uh, an incoming intern or, or a new intern, right, you're still maybe working on your suturing, you're not tying, but you have simulators there that can be lower high fidelity or sp procedure specific. And you can sit down with a faculty member or a senior resident who can watch you do stuff and then give you pointers on where your weaknesses are. And instead of doing the knots that you're good at, 
do the ones that you aren't, right? Focus on the skills that you're not good at so that what is hard for you today will be easy tomorrow. Um, it's hard to practice in the operating room. Uh, you know, we, we have to meet the demands of patient care. Unfortunately, there are some maneuvers in some cases where that is the only opportunity that we have to practice. And so we still do it there. And so videotape your cases, go back and watch how you perform, have someone watch them with you and, and, and see where you need to work on. And again, work on the areas where you're weak and those weaknesses will become strengths. Um, so I think for this, it's really kind of practice, practice, practice and developing good habits. Um, so work on your basics first, get grounded in those. Um, once you've got it, identify your weaknesses and, and work on those next. And again, having a helpful eye to watch you, which is what your faculty is doing and, and giving you feedback on is a great way to find those weaknesses and work on them. Um, my music teacher used to say this to me and she uh, had a huge impact on my life, but her saying was, you don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you can't get it wrong. Right. And that's when you know that you're done with that skill and ready to move on to the next one. Um, for the faculty, um, continue to do what you always do, right? Model expert performance, um, provide corrective feedback to the residents, um, but do so in a sort of specific way. We often have the tendency to say, um, you know, you did a really good job in that case. That's not all that helpful. It may be true, but it's probably more helpful to say, hey, you did a really good job in that case, but there was one area of the case where I saw that you struggled a little bit. We're going to work on that specific area for our next operation, right? So identify a specific goal for them to focus on and work on. That is their area of weakness so that they can continue to practice that and turn it into a strength. When they when their performance improves and you identify that strength, find something else that they need to work on. And I think we all always have to remember that when we're operating with people, um, there is a lot of cognitive overload and, and the stuff that we try and teach in real time in the OR often doesn't sink in because the residents are so focused on what they're actually doing that they can't often process the information that we give them. So using the word stop, uh, pausing the operation and telling them what you want them to do is often more helpful than trying to do it on the fly when they're still operating. So I think deliberate practice is important, um, but obviously this is an equation and deliberate practice alone is not enough. Um, so uh, midterm number one, uh, you're going to answer about 10 questions. So you're going to write down some numbers. So everybody like grab your phone, open up your notes page. If you got a loose pe piece of paper, go ahead and grab it. And I want you to think about um, how these 10 questions apply to you. Uh, be a little careful because the scales change with each question, right? So new ideas and projects distract me from previous ones. Five is not at all like me, uh, all the way down to one very much like me. Setbacks don't discourage me. I don't give up easily. This time, one is not at all like me, all the way up to five, very much like me. And so it'll be those two repeating scales for the next eight questions. I often set a goal, but later choose to pursue a different one, five to one. Or I am a hard worker, one to five. I have difficulty maintaining my focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete. To one. Or I finish whatever I begin one to five. My interests change from year to year, five to one. I am diligent. I never give up one to five. I've been obsessed with a certain idea or project for a short time, but later lost interest, five to one. Or I've overcome setbacks to conquer an important challenge, one to five. All right, everybody get all of those? So add up all your points from the previous exam and divide it by 10. So you should have a score somewhere in the range of zero to five. Uh, anybody know what that was or what that is? So that's your grit scale. That's your grit score. Um, and over here on the right side of this slide is uh, um, what your score is a, as a percentage of um, U.S. adults who were sampled on that scale. So uh, and grit is the second part of our numerator. 
So grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals. And Angela Duckworth is a PhD psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and she's really dedicated her career to the study of this concept. Uh, and she, this book is a really fascinating read for anyone who has interest in it. And the book really kind of debunks the idea that success comes from innate ability, uh, but really comes much more from effort and resilience. In the first chapter of the book, she focuses on um, uh, West Point, which is uh, the U.S. Uh, Armed Forces Academy. To get into West Point, not only do you have to be like an elite student, but you have to be able to run, I think it's like a five or six minute mile. You have to be physically conditioned. And you also have to get like a letter of a support from a senator or a, a congressman. So you have to do a lot of extra things beyond just being a great student. And yet a significant portion of these like incredibly gifted kids drop out during the first month or two, which is called beast barracks, where they're exposed to incredible hours of work um, and, and a lot of stress and rigor. Um, and they could not figure out what made people survive this and what got people through. And then uh, Professor Duckworth applied her scale to all of the student body and it 100% like correlated with their grit score. So the grittier students had a much better chance of making it through beast barracks than the ones that lacked grit. So she really believes that effort counts twice. Um, and for someone who works at Duke, it is absolutely like sacrilegious to put up a picture of a UNC basketball player. But I can't think of anyone better than uh, than Michael Jordan for this. Right. So Michael Jordan had talent. There is no doubt about that. But he developed that talent through a lot of effort and a lot of practice. He then took that talent, and if you watch uh, The Last Waltz, the documentary about his six championships, you see that he was rough, right? He put everyone on the team through paces. He made everyone work as hard as he worked. So even though he was by far the best player on the team, he also worked harder than everyone else on the team and motivated others, often in a difficult way to get there. And that's what led to his six rings, right? So he had the, the talent, he applied effort to get that, and then he took that talent applied effort to get that and had incredible success. Um, you also need resilience. You have to be able to bounce back when the going is tough. And the Japanese have a saying, uh, nana karobi ya oki, which stands for fall seven times and stand up eight. That every time you get pushed down, you have to have the ability to see hope and be able to stand back up in the face of it. So grit is not an intrinsic um, factor. It's something that can grow with time. Uh, but there are certain conditions that you need to grow grit. And so when you look at this scale, this is patients or uh, uh, age of people and their grit score. And you can see that uh, that people aren't necessarily born gritty. They develop it with time. So to develop it, you have to have interest in whatever you're doing, right? We're training to be surgeons because you want to be a surgeon and you like surgery. I would say you have interest in what you're doing. Um, you have to be able to practice, um, ideally deliberate practice, focusing on your weaknesses, never being satisfied with your current level of performance. And you have to put in hours a day, every day of the week, every week of the year. Um, it is helpful if you, there's the perception that whatever you're doing has purpose. Um, the passion for work tends to be increased if you have the conviction that your work matters. And again, I think we are uniquely positioned to have that privilege in our day to day lives. And that our work is not only important to us, but it's important to the people that we get to operate on. And lastly, you have to have hope. You have to understand that as your grit develops, that you can keep going when the going gets tough. That you can fall seven times and, and be ready to rise that eighth. My example of this is a, a former resident named Nate Baggett. And I, I don't know why, but I still like kind of get a little choked up through this portion. So pardon me if I, uh, if I uh, start to tear up a little bit. So Nate, um, Nate was born in Iowa uh, and Nate uh, went to undergraduate studies at, um, at the University of Iowa and then came to the University of Wisconsin for medical school. Um, late in uh, his collegiate career, he was diagnosed with PSC uh, and came to us uh, as a student with an interest in surgery, um, but also uh, with a pretty bad disease that uh, really kind of hit a much more aggressive course during his time in medical school. So when Nate started his third year rotations, um, he was very interested in surgery, um, but he was also placed on the liver transplant list uh, because his PSC was evolving at a rapid pace. Uh, this was his liver at the time of his first transplant. Um, he had a uh, horrific post-operative course um, and actually battled back through that uh, to do fairly well. Um, and during that time, um, 
the after about six months, the first liver started to fail, um, unfortunately. And so he underwent another liver transplant. He took some time off um, in between those two, um, was able to get back to some of his medical studies. But then after the second liver, liver transplant, he was now sort of a fourth year student um, and was selected by his peers to be the commencement speaker at their graduation. Um, and this is his talk. The first part of the liver transplant is only two weeks to the start of his third year of the medical school. He has been an incredible role model for peers and faculty alike. He demonstrated determination, resiliency, and humor during his journey to complete his MD. We are absolutely delighted that he is with us today to share a few words and his perspectives. Please join me in welcoming the podium. I'll be back. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. It's a huge honor to be up here with you as your commencement speaker. As Dean Gordon alluded to, your selection as your speaker may have been a little, a little bit of a mistake on your part. Because I was just starting the hospital on my day of the season. But maybe some people would say, the question of your hope that I would be able to see this, and then the silver would be just one speaker shorter. Either way, thank you. I'm so glad I'm able to be here celebrating the class of 2017 one last time. So, too weak to stand. Um, Nate still rises to the occasion. Um, he actually did really well for about a year after that second liver transplant. Uh, he finished up medical school. He entered the match for general surgery, and we were absolutely ecstatic to match him. In between submitting ours and his match lists and match day, which you can see here, um, I don't know how well it shows through, but you can see a little bit of yellow in his eyes. Um Fast forward about three months to orientation, and uh, that's not uh, an Instagram filter. That's a Billy Rubin in the 20s from his second liver transplant failing. Um, but he still showed up to work every day. And when he couldn't work uh, clinically, he went and did research. Um, he was just incredibly driven to always be working and doing things as he, um, as he was battling with disease. He underwent a third liver transplant during his intern year, um, really honestly almost passed away multiple times in our ICU during recovery from that. Um, and then that was right before COVID. Uh, so he decided to leave residency at that point um, and uh, took time, moved back closer to his family in Iowa. Uh, and I am incredibly happy to report that this is Nate today with his third liver transplant completely working. And that's his wife and daughter. Um, and he's just an incredible human being uh, who, in the face of incredible adversity, uh, is always willing to stand back up. Um, he never rejoined a general surgery residency. He's an emergency medicine resident, um, and he's one of their academic chief residents this year and just an incredible person. But I don't think you really have to look too far to find probably equally incredible people here right? Um, these are all of your residents. And I, unfortunately, some of them didn't have pictures that I could pull off the internet. Um, but it takes an incredible amount of grit to do what you guys are all doing, right? And I'm sure that you see these same attributes that, that we saw in Nate in one another. Um, and so continue to have that. Uh, and it will continue to grow over the course of your residency and your time as a surgeon. But it's an important skill for you to survive and, and, and not only survive, but thrive throughout your career as a surgeon. So again, um, grit and surgery go hand in hand, right? Um, surgery meets and exceeds all of those conditions to grow grit. Um, certainly it has interest, practice, purpose, and hope. Um, but remember that effort counts twice and there will be hard times, right? We all have complications. Dealing with them is still terrible. 15 years into practice, probably 30, 40 years into practice. It never feels good to have a complication, but knowing that you're doing a lot of good for a lot of other people is what keeps a lot of us going. So always be resilient in the way that you approach um, your life. 
again, it, it doesn't happen overnight, right? So set a long-term goal. Uh, maybe the goal is to master surgery. Think about that as being where you want to end up, but know that you're not going to get there in one day. Instead, start working on the small things. So for the early trainees, focus on your cognitive skills, right? Read, read a ton, understand pathophysiology, know how to treat diseases, um, work on your technical skills. Again, focusing on the weaknesses and finding those and making them strengths. Um, for the more senior residents, maybe you need to work on your non-cognitive skills. You need to learn how to lead a team and to um, be a professional that can interact with all other uh, people throughout surgery. So there's plenty of ways to get to be a master of surgery, and they they certainly don't come overnight. Um, and I think it's always important to continually reassess those goals, make sure they're still in line. Um, but more importantly, never be satisfied that you've met them all. You can always be better than you are. All right. Your second midterm doesn't require any writing. This one's a lot easier. I just want you to, to think about whether you agree or disagree with the following statements. Um, one, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. Two, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it quite a bit. Three, you can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. Or four, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are, right? Four fairly easy concepts. Um, these are the mindsets. Um, and this to me is one of the more fascinating uh, reads of this group. Um, so Carol Dweck is a PhD psychologist from Stanford. Um, and this book focuses on the two different mindsets that she's spent her career studying. In the fixed mindset, you have a belief that everyone has a fixed set of skills or abilities, right? You're, you're born with a certain level of intelligence. That's the, that's the hand you're dealt, and that's what you've got. And if you have sort of a fixed mindset, you tend to agree with statements one and three a little bit more than statements two and four. The growth mindset is a belief that people can develop their abilities through learning. Uh, and so if you are more of a growth mindset type of person, you agree with statements two and four and disagree with one and three. And so to me, the growth mindset is our denominator. It's incredible how these two different mindsets play out in real life. So if we, if we start on the left side with the fixed mindset, which is, again, just a, a fairly simple belief that intelligence is static and that you're born with a certain set of skills and that's all you've got. Those types of people tend to avoid challenges because if they're challenged and they fail, it's a threat to them internally, right? They feel like they failed because they, they can't do it. And therefore, they shouldn't even try because they'll never be able to do it. So when they reach an obstacle that they can't overcome, they kind of give up. They quit. Um, they don't want to apply effort. They feel like they should either be able to do something based on their natural abilities. And if they can't, again, it, it invalidates who they are. And so they don't really work harder to try and do it. Um, they ignore or really oppose useful feedback. Um, again, for them, it's all about whether they can or can't. Um, the success of others for them is a threat. If they see someone better than them, uh, they recognize that they're not as great as they think they are. And again, that that is a challenge for them. And so when they go out into the professional workforce, they tend to underperform at the different jobs that they do. On the opposite side of the spectrum is the growth mindset. And again, this is just the belief that you can learn and you can get better right? Uh, pretty straightforward. Those people embrace challenges, right? A challenge to them is something unique. They want to figure out how to beat it. When they hit an obstacle, um, they persist. They jump over it. They run around it. They figure out a way to solve whatever problem they're dealing with. And they recognize that to do that, they have to apply effort to it. So they practice and they work to get better. They thrive on criticism. They want feedback. They want to know what they're bad at so that they can be better. And the success of others for them is something that's aspirational. They want to kind of narrow that gap so that they can reach others and perform at that high level. And not surprisingly, these people tend to be much more successful in all aspects of life. For this one, uh, I pick my wife. Uh, my wife, uh, whose name is Caprice Greenberg, uh, my wife is the chair of surgery at UNC. Um, she is an incredibly gifted uh, researcher uh, and a breast surgeon as well. And I love this picture. This is, uh, I, I think, from her visiting professorship here. And it's I, that's William Osler in the back, right, from when I zoom in. I love the fact that William Osler here is surrounded by three female surgeons, two of whom are chairs of major departments of surgery. I suspect he did not see that coming uh, in his lifetime or, or potentially any lifetime beyond. But I think this is a fabulous picture. I chose my wife for this not because she is an incredible researcher and, and, and really a, an amazing person, 
But if you look at these two pictures, she recognizes that when a camera is pointed at her, um, you can manipulate the muscles of the face to form what we call a smile, right? When she turns that camera around towards herself uh, and tries to take a selfie, really disastrous results occur. Um, and this is not like an isolated case. There are countless and countless pictures of her, like not looking at the camera, eyes closed, uh, just backlit, like it, they're really bad. This is not a hard skill, right? Our teenage daughters like nail this. They totally know how to do this. Our son was four years old when he took this one. And this is legitimately a monkey selfie. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this story. So this was, this was uh, there was a, a, a nature photographer who like left his camp and a bunch of monkeys got into it. And when he went back through the scroll of films, he found this. Like this is a legit monkey selfie and he tried to sell the picture. And then the animal rights activists got very angry at him and said, you don't have the monkey's life rights to sell uh, its image. And he was a good person. So he took the money that he made off of it and donated it back to the nature preserve where he was actually doing photography, which is great. But that's way better than the pictures that my wife took. He's kind of smiling and, and it looks pretty good. Um Again, this is not for lack of trying, right? There's 238 selfies in her like iPhone thing. And even like the picture that denotes the selfie folder is a bad selfie. Um, now they're not all hers. I don't know how that one snuck into her camera roll because that's clearly me, but my wife like never backs down from a challenge. When she can't figure something out, she just works and she figures out what to do differently um, and will not quit until she solves it. And so with time and effort, she has clearly improved this skill, um, but that is just who she is. Like she has an absolute growth mindset and she like loves to get feedback. She loves to be challenged and she loves to figure out how to solve that problem. And I think it is it has um, taken her to where she is today, which is an incredible accomplishment. So I think it's really important for us as faculty to remember that um, we want to push trainees towards a growth mindset. We want our trainees to think that they can improve if they, uh, if they work at it, right? It's very true that some people have natural talents. We all know that there are some residents that just get it, right? There are some people that can come in and operate. Those people can be beaten by those that will work harder to become better surgeons, right? So no matter how much natural talent you have, um, you can be eclipsed by someone who really is hungry and wants to get better. Um, there are ways for us to foster a growth mindset, even through how we speak to our residents. So on the left side, um, and, and I mean, I, I was super guilty of, of using a lot of these terms, right? Great job. You're so talented. If you say that again, it's talking to them as sort of a fixed mindset person. That is who they are. That is their level of abilities, That it's not a thing for improvement. If instead you get them to focus on other aspects and push them towards a growth mindset, um, you can actually get them to think about how they can overcome any other challenges or, or work to improve. So the, well, at least you tried, uh, but instead of that, how about that didn't work? Let's talk about how you approached it and what might work better, right? Instead of calling someone so talented, which is an intrinsic or innate ability, think about what you could do better, right? Find their weakness, let them identify it and think about what they can work on to get better. Um, and I love the bottom one. Maybe this just isn't your strength, right? Don't worry, you have other things to contribute. Um, I love this, right? I have high standards. I'm holding you to them because I know you can reach them together, right? So again, focus on what people can do later with effort, not, not who they are as a person. So we've taken deliberate practice. We've added grit. We've poured it over a growth mindset. And if we do all of that, uh, we hopefully get to experience flow. Flow is the sensation of optimal experience. It's essentially happiness. Um, and Mihail Csikszentmihalyi, which is one of the hardest names to pronounce that I've ever seen, um, is a PhD psychologist at uh, the University of Chicago who has uh, really come up with this concept. And in the book Flow, he, he kind of goes over the conditions for optimal experience in re interpersonal relationships and work in in day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and I will say of all the books, this was by far, I think, the hardest read. And I felt like it, it required significant grit to actually get through it. Um, but it is an interesting concept. So I want you to, to think about a day in clinic. All right. Um, your clinic, if it's anything like mine, it's usually overbooked at most time slots. 
right? Our, our system, our policy is that if patients are 30 minutes late, their appointment is canceled. So your first patient comes 29 minutes late and they let them in. Um, you have incomplete imaging and op notes on the majority of your patients that are coming to see you that day. And just to add insult to injury, uh, when you were driving in, uh, your car blew a tire and maybe your basement flooded the night before, right? That's a bad day at work. Uh, when that happens, you're experiencing what's called psychic entropy. You are not in the moment. You are actually not able to think clearly about anything. And all of your day-to-day -day activities feel stressed. They feel rushed. You can't commit your mind to really think about anything. And, and you really perform poorly in your, your day. Now, put yourself into an operating room, right? Imagine your favorite operation. It doesn't matter what specialty you are. Uh, in the U.S., imagine that you're doing it on this unicorn of like a 35-year-old male with a BMI of 21, but you guys have a much lower rate of obesity than we do uh, a little further south. So, uh, But imagine you have like this perfect patient for your favorite operation, and the entire case goes perfectly, right? You don't spill a drop of blood. Your pager never goes off. There were no interruptions. And depending on which operation you chose, that like one to six hours of your life just passed by in an instant, right? That's flow right? That is something that we have all experienced. It's probably what drove all of us to choose to go into surgery. And it is actually one of the incredible benefits of our career that we get to experience this more from our professional work than pretty much any other profession. Um, and it's why one of the main joys I think that we all have of, of being surgeons. So there are a lot of conditions required to actually enter that flow state. And again, when you read through this list, you'll see that this is exactly what an operation is, right? You have to have a, ch a task that you have a chance to complete. Um, if you're uh, too challenged by that opportunity, you usually end up in this state of anxiety. Um, if you're too good for that case, you end up a little bit bored, but you have to kind of stay in this flow channel where your skill and the challenge continue to rise over the course of your career. And so as we develop as surgeons and you go from your first 10 years of practice to second, and you're kind of in your mid career, you got to take on the harder cases so that you keep being challenged and keep getting to experience that flow state. But if you look at everything else, like the, the, it, there should be the ability to concentrate. There should be clear goals. There should be immediate feedback, like bleeding. Uh, it's pretty good feedback, I think. Um, and when that happens, most people dis describe this state of flow as having sort of um, uh, control over one's actions, but losing that sense of time and this deep but meaningless effort, right? It's, it's what we all get to experience day to day. Um, and surgery is, it's just built for this, right? Uh, and in particular, I think academic surgery really lends itself to this because we tend to get a lot of the more difficult cases, which continue to challenge us over the course of our careers. We have the opportunity to work with trainees to, um, to make them be better. And we have the opportunity to do new and innovative procedures and do research. So we have incredible opportunities to maintain a flow state throughout the course of our careers. And, um, and it's just a privilege. It's hard for me to describe anyone else's flow state. I used to intend to still experience it more during English hernia repairs. This is just one of my favorite operations. Um, and now I, I don't really do much other than hold the camera uh, and usually tell jokes or listen to music in the operating room and our fellows and residents are doing the case. So I don't get to experience as much. Um, but I, I, this is still one of the operations where I just feel like it time flies by while doing it. It's still, I think, very fun for me. So surgery is a challenging field, right? Um, I, I think the challenging is what makes it good. Uh, if it were easy and everyone could do it, it probably wouldn't be as much fun or as challenging as it is. Um, it requires deliberate practice. It, it absolutely requires grit. And I think it benefits from having a growth mindset. Um, over the course of your career, you'll have failures. We all do. Um, I think it's important to learn from them. I think it's absolutely important to hate them. Um, and I think it's most important to practice to avoid them. And I love this uh, quote from Churchill who said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I think that's one of the things to continue to focus on over the course of your career. Um, the growth mindset to me is one of the keys to this equation, right? The more you think about it, um, if you can just get someone to believe that they can be better, um, they actually will be better. Uh, it's a fairly easy concept and we have the ability to push our residents to do that. Um, but you have to try, like you have to be willing to put in the effort. So as I was kind of reflecting on this equation, um, uh, Pamela was very kind to send me uh, Dr. Sigmund's biography, and I, I kind of read through it and thought to myself, there's really kind of no one that can better personify that equation than you. 
Um, and looking through all the things that you've done over your career, it's incredible, right? So you were director of surgical education. That's clearly an education-based job. Division chief of general surgery, that's a clinical job. Those have two very different skill sets that you had to learn and uh, apply new ideas to. You introduced laparoscopic surgery, a completely new field of surgery to, to a generation of surgeons. Um, so you, again, willing to, to learn new techniques to practice to get better. Um, and then uh, transitioned into the sexual harassment office, uh, co-chaired the McGill University IRB. Uh, all the things that you've done show the incredible amount of effort and impact that you've had here. And I suspect um, that you've gotten the opportunity to experience flow many, many times over the course of your career. So um, it is an absolute honor to be here and, uh, and giving this lecture in your name. And, and it's been such a pleasure to get to speak with you last night and yesterday afternoon as well. So I, I love getting feedback on this talk. Um, I think it's really interesting to see what people say. And, and one of the points of feedback was my equation is wrong uh, mathematically. Uh, they said, you know, you say you want people to have a growth mindset, but you have growth mindset on the denominator. And so if growth mindset increases, then actually flow would decrease. And that is mathematically correct. Um, and instead of going back and redoing all my slides, I would like to present the new equation for successful surgery, which is now mathematically accurate. Um, the, uh, in case anyone is sort of uh, fuzzy on this stuff and doesn't completely believe it, I guess one book of supplemental reading would be this one, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Um, I don't think it was a great read. Uh, it's more kind of funny. It basically just says, don't sweat the small stuff, right? Uh, don't try. Happiness is a problem. You are not special. Uh, and my personal favorite of the dot, 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 and then you die. Um, uh, it might have some help of like kind of just turning out the uh, the noise around you. But for the most part, I uh, I, I, I think it's um, I think still much more about how much you try and the effort that you put into the things that we do. So um, again, thank you so much for this incredible honor and happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was a wonderful uh, introduction to our morning. And um, does anybody in the room have any questions? I'm gonna try and see if I can see if there's anything in the chat or anybody that wants to put their hand up. Yes, Mark. Very interesting. Um, I, I would call this another um, American sort of individualistic grasp of flow, which is not hard to bring in a bit. But the, the, the question is uh, what is the value of or the role of the community? It sounds like individual is an island that you can know, assign and say. Uh, but where, where is the role of the, the other person? Called, uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, so I think the community plays into this in the in the form of um, uh, largely the coach, right? The person who's helping facilitate. Um, it can also be the role models that you see and the ones that you want to emulate. Um, and I think the for me, the community as a as a trainee, as a resident, that's that's the esprit de corps, right? That's that's where you get your grit and your resilience because you have your friends who are there and your colleagues who are there to help lift you up during the difficult times and be there to to have help you keep going on. So that's sort of where I see it in our in our lives. Yep, at the back. Um, I So I, I think that, and I, I spoke with the surgery residents a lot about this yesterday, like I think feedback is one of the areas where we are woefully poor in general as faculty members. Um, we tend to give people feedback on a like monthly or two monthly basis in the form of an end of rotation evaluation that just basically says that they're at PGY level. And when you ask for one positive comment, we say good hands. And when you ask for one negative, we say read more, right? Like it's not helpful. Um, 
So I, I know that this is, it sounds like maybe a charge subject, but I think EPAs are a much better way of doing uh, feedback that you get actionable feedback on a clinical encounter um, with a forward facing look towards the next clinical encounter that's of a similar patient so that you can identify what you can work on for that next patient to be more entrusted. Um, so I, I think that that's a much better way of giving feedback and, and it's much more timely and it's much more frequent. I think there's a few hands in online. So, um, Cleve, you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, I do. It was an amazing talk, very positive, uh, very uplifting. But by nature, uh, I'm a little more of a of a cynical person. So let me ask you a question. You make a compelling argument that it's not only about innate ability and maybe deficiencies in ability can be overcome with many of the things you've described. But the reality is that we also accept trainees who really aren't suited for surgery very quickly in dentistry. You've got to show that you can carve a piece of chalk to get into dentistry. And I would argue in surgery, we do things that are much more complex. That's not part of the admission requirement. Any thoughts on the fact that at some point, some basic technical ability is a fundamental prerequisite to getting good at this? Um, so I think, yes, I think that there are people that probably can't do it. Um, and, and certainly, uh, people that shouldn't, um, we need to stop sharing. Got it. There we go. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that there are people that, um, that go into it wanting to be a surgeon and for a variety of different reasons, uh, really honestly, probably shouldn't. Um, I, I think that it's very hard, uh, to show those people, um, that this is not the right thing for them. Um, and I think that's always been the challenge, right? The people who I think get it, the people who are really struggling and have insight and recognize that struggle, they feel awful coming to work. Um, it's the people who don't have that insight that are the real challenges. And I think trying to help them through that very difficult period where they have to come to grips with the fact that this may not be the right thing for them is unfortunately part of our job because that's to protect the safety of patients. Uh, but it is a very hard thing to do. Um, and I think one of the other things that we just really, unfortunately, do not necessarily do well because we don't identify it. I don't think everyone can be a surgeon. Um, I think a lot of people that struggle, however, um, if they work enough and eventually something clicks, sometimes the people who we have real concerns about, if they're willing to apply time and effort, they absolutely get there. Um, and I, I always view those people as being ones that, you know, we've often have them repeat a year and that hurts their ability to be employed. But to me, that's not their fault. Like people just develop at different times, but if they get to the right end point and they can do it safely, then that's a win for us. I think. Appreciate the answer. Thank you. Um, we have Dr. Sigmund with a question. Yes. Firstly, thank you for one of the talks. Um, when you first start doing web stop surgery, it's, it's hard it's hard to get close. There are too many people who do that for you. And so I, when I started here, I had a work with a buddy. It was 50 cases we worked together and we had all the other. Sorry. Anyway, so I, I worked with a buddy. We fed off each other in order to make sure that we first we were doing things properly and secondly, we were improving. But I recorded the first 50 cases we did. And every weekend I would go up to the cottage and I would watch the recordings and I would go over each one and say, well, how come we got bleeding here? We should have been too close here and too far there. The interesting thing is I think my wife learned how to do the operation after 50 <laughs> cases. So that uh, one of the harder things for me was to start throwing out these tapes 30 years later to say, I'll never use them again. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's another question online. I don't know the, uh, see the patient, uh, the person. <laughs> it's Carl Eric. Sorry. It, it's Carl Eric. Uh, I'm actually an anesthesiologist. So, and I really enjoyed your talk. Um, this topic has really interested me both as an athlete and when I became a father and it actually changed how I interacted with my daughter and gave her feedback. Uh, one, and I read Carol Dweck's uh, book, which I, highly recommend to everybody. It's a great book. Um, now, one of the things that that struck me was how different children and adults respond to feedback and how you actually need to be a bit more positive when you give adults feedback. So I was wondering what your comment was on that. And also, 
how do you work on people that have a fixed mindset to get them to a growth mindset? Because from what I read, it seemed much more easy with a child than, than it is with an adult that's already established those pathways and the, and that way of thinking, especially in a context where we don't have trainees with us for three years continuously every day. You know, we have them for a few days and then they go. So how do you work on those people? So, so I, I totally agree that I think it's much more um, uh, helpful to be uplifting to people when you give them feedback, right? So everyone likes to hear like the nice compliments over the feedback. So it's always good to, I think, start with a compliment <laughs> and then say, hey, here's what I think you did really well during that case. Here's the areas where I think you could actually work on, right? So start with the good. Um, and then at the end, kind of sprinkle in the stuff that it not necessarily was even bad, but an area where they can improve. And then if they were really good, maybe sandwich in another good comment there at the end. I told the residents yesterday that one of the, the best pieces of feedback I ever got as a med student was I was like suturing closed a subcuticular stitch and the, the colorectal surgeon who was letting me close it goes, Jake, you're, um, you're not good, but at least you're slow. And I was like, wait a minute. Those were, those were both negative. Like those were two negatives. Uh, I thought there'd be a positive after the butt. Um, but then I knew I had to be better and to be faster. So I had two things to work on. I thought it was actually very valuable feedback. Um, so I, I think starting with a compliment is helpful because it like engages your learner, but then finding at least like one take home point where they can focus on for the next thing is really helpful. For the people who really, I think are ingrained in their fixed mindset, like I've, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, I, one, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I see a ton of those people amongst our trainees. Like, I just don't know that if we select people around that, like, I don't, we don't see a lot of that. Um, when we've had people like that, I've always been, I've always asked them why they feel that way. Like, why do you feel like you can't do this? What are you doing to try and get better? Like, how are you practicing? What's your, what's your strategy to try and do this? Like, are you going to the SIM center? Are you working extra hours? Are you doing other things? And if they're not doing those things, then you can come up with, I think, an individualized uh, learning plan for them to try and help with it. Um, but but asking them why and, and trying to see where they are in terms of a self-assessment, I think, is really helpful. I just have a quick question. You brought up EPAs and the, as the competency director and people that fill out EPAs. We often don't get asked to complete those unless the person asking you feels that they're going to get a four or five because they know they're, they're going to get that box checked off. How do you get them to embrace the idea that getting an EPA or it filled out when they might not be getting that four or five is valuable? So um, do the trainees have to like drive the EPA process or can you guys yeah. drive it? Yeah. So I, that, I do think that that was kind of like one of the flaws of EPAs was that it was meant to be, they were implemented in sort of like that learner driven fashion. I still think it should be our job as the faculty to, to give that feedback, whether the learners request it or not, because I do think there's going to be a tendency to do what you said. Um, but I, I also think it's really it's very uncomfortable to em embrace being bad at something. Right. Um, I, and, and like when I switched from uh, doing a lot of stuff laparoscopically to robotically, like I hated robotic surgery. I was like, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? Like I could do this much faster laparoscopically, much better. And I'm like going back in my learning curve. And I only did it because I thought it was important to stay modern. Doing that has now opened some doors to do things that I couldn't do laparoscopically, the complex hernia stuff that uh, that many of you probably just read about in the New York Times uh, <laughs> this week. Um, uh, that's really hard lap, right? And so having a, a robotic skill set allows you to do some stuff that you can't otherwise do, but but that early period is really painful. Um, and embracing that that sort of pain and not being good at something and then watching yourself get better in the end is very satisfying, but in real time is really challenging. Um, and so I think you have to kind of embrace being not great at everything, um, but know that with work, you can get better. I guess, and, tr and trusting that you're, you have coaches that'll help you do yep. that. So it's great. I think we're going to draw the uh, rounds to a close because everybody has to get to work this morning. I want to thank uh, Dr. Greenberg for joining us and uh, present him with our gifts. I think I believe there's a tie and a plaque. Oh. So next time you come, you can wear your McGill tie. Perfect. And, and so thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.